This is going to be Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and we're going to look at some things about dreams and nightmares and things like that. There's a lot about that in this chapter. Ecclesiastes 5.1 says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. So Solomon says, Keep thy foot. You know, a lot of times in your dreams or when you're scared at night as a kid, you're afraid that something's going to grab your foot from underneath the bed. You remember that? Or from out of the closet. But Proverbs 3.26 says, For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. And he says in Ecclesiastes 5.1, Keep thy foot. When thou goest to the house of God, the Lord can keep the enemy from grabbing you by the foot. And the enemy, in turn, gets his foot caught in the net that he had laid out for you. In Psalm 9:15, the heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. While the enemy may be smarter than you, he's not smarter than the Lord. So the saved individual is always at a great advantage. And the Lord will keep your foot from being taken. At the same time, you need to keep your feet where they belong. He said, keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God. Back when Solomon was around, the house of God was a temple that he built. In this age that we're in, the house of God is you. In 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Then in 1 Timothy 3.15, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how, to, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You need to know how to behave yourself in the house of God. That is, behave yourself in your earthly vessel that you have to walk around in as a member of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let your feet run into mischief. Romans 3.15 talks about those who have feet which are swift to shed blood. Proverbs 6.18 talks about feet that are swift in running to mischief. So keep thy foot. And the Lord will keep your foot from being taken. The church building is not the house of God. That's just an expression when men call it that. When a congregation really believes the church is the house of God and they have lower standards for holy living in that supposed house of God, it not only hurts them, but it hurts their church. It hurts their pastor. And it can give the enemies an occasion to blaspheme. For example, when they call their church the house of God and then they lower their standards when they leave that house of God, it gives people occasion to blaspheme. A church building that is filled with born-again believers preaching the Bible and doing the things of God can become a house of God, practically speaking. But doctrinally, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. You need to act right all throughout the week not just when you're in a certain building. You need to live like a Christian all throughout the week. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Keep your foot when thou goest into the house of God. Proverbs 15, 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the, of the upright is his delight. And in Ecclesiastes 5, 1, he says... Be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. If you really want to keep your foot, then you need to walk in the light. First John 1 John 1.7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Remember as a kid when you get up out of bed at night and you go to the bathroom, you turn the light on, so the monsters under the bed don't get your foot? That's how it was when, when you were a kid. 
But now the kids listen to Eminem, who says he's friends with the monsters under his bed. And I don't think they're as nice as the ones off that 80s movie. The ones Eminem is friends with are the spiritual wickedness in high places. And there really is something trying to get your foot. You may not be able to see it. But if you're a born-again believer, you wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we will see the enemy before he t attacks, before he tries to grab our foot. Your life is like a nightmare sometimes come true, sometimes like a dream come true, because there is something trying to grab your foot. And how else is it like a dream? You can talk in your sleep. You know how sometimes you talk in your sleep? Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. God is in heaven. Daniel 2.28 says, There is a God in heaven. He hears everything you're saying. The tongue in your mouth is a deadly thing. James 3, 5, and 6, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Solomon says, Let thy words be few. And that is for a good reason. You can talk yourself into a mess. There have been cases where a man was cheating on his wife and he started saying the mistress's name in his sleep and the wife heard it. Your dreams reveal some things because you can talk in your sleep. In Ecclesiastes 5.3 it says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. For some reason a lot of people talk about, they'll say to me, how I'm so smart or something. But but trust me, I'm not very smart. I don't know much. I just don't look dumb in certain situations because I just don't open my mouth. So they don't realize how stupid that I actually am. In Proverbs ten nineteen, it says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. The less you talk, the more smart people will think that you are. Ecclesiastes 5.4, When thou vowest to vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. The real context of not running your mouth here in Ecclesiastes is when it comes to making a vow to God. You don't want to make a vow that you can't keep. Deuteronomy 23.21, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be a sin in thee. So, if you're going to make a vow, you really need to watch what you say. Ecclesiastes 5, 5, and 6 says, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel, that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? Jephthah made a horrible vow in Judges chapter 11 that ended with the death of his daughter. His mouth suffered his flesh to sin. And I'm sure Jephthah dreamed of his daughter after that and regretted every bit of that vow that he made. You can suffer your mouth to cause your flesh to sin, even if it's a good vow, because your fleshy desire can cause you to break the vow. In Ecclesiastes 5, 7, For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. Some people base their faith on their dreams. Many YouTube videos are made on a dream someone had. Many times men will claim God gave them extra visions that aren't even in Scripture in their dreams. God possibly might scare a man by having him dream about hell or something like that. But I don't believe the Lord is communicating to men in dreams as he did in the Old Testament because now we have a complete word of God and he's speaking to us through that word of God. Every time you have a dream, write it down when you wake up the next day and notice how vain everything in it is. 
This could reveal that you are spending more time on the vain things in this life and your desire is on this earth and not in heaven. Colossians 3.2 says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. I've heard my pastor talk about how he dreams he's preaching and he was preaching out loud in his sleep. His sleep talk revealed where his heart was and where his mind was at. But Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 5.2, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. Solomon says, Be not rash with thy mouth. Have you ever really heard someone talking in their sleep? Sometimes it sounds a bit creepy. Uh, this one girl told me that her mother would wake up in bed at night and talk in a man's voice, and sometimes different languages. And during the day, this lady was talking to psychics and messing around with witchcraft. She was doing things during the day, and it was affecting her as she slept. Sometimes Christians during the daytime will talk, and when you hear the things coming out of their mouth, you think to yourself, are they awake? Or are they just talking in their sleep? They can't be in their right mind right now. They must be talking in their sleep. Ephesians 5.14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Romans 13.11, And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Some Christians are sleep talking. When I hear profession Christians boasting about voting for a transgender loving baby killer, I'm thinking, are you awake? Are you that blind? Do you still have your blind, uh, sleep time blindfold things on? I mean, where are you at? Are you talking in your sleep or are you awake? Ecclesiastes 5.3, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. The more you sleep talk, the more everyone is going to know how you have failed to study the scriptures. A fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Listen to a speech by someone who doesn't want to retain God in their knowledge. They are wide awake, but it's like they are talking in their sleep. And the more a person like that says, the more foolish they look. I don't talk much. I'm very quiet. If I keep my mouth shut most times, it just turns out better. But remember that there is a time to speak, but there is also that time to keep silent. Unless you've got something biblical to say or worthwhile to say, I'd just shut up. Ecclesiastes 5.3, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. So Solomon says, A dream cometh through the multitude of business. You'll find that the business you're doing during the day is what you'll dream about. I stack ice cream on pallets in a freezer all day, so it's not far-fetched for me to dream about stacking ice cream on a pallet. So it's like I'm working off the clock in my sleep. Do you know why you have dirty dreams? It's because you watch filthy stuff. A dream cometh with a multitude of business. If you're busy watching that, that's what you're going to dream about. Jude, verse 8, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Do you know why you have nightmares? There are different reasons, but if you watch scary stuff, you're probably going to dream about scary stuff. If you look at what Solomon said another way, he said, a dream cometh through the multitude of business. If you have a dream of being something, if you start getting busy, then maybe that dream will come true. For example, if you want to learn the Bible, the Bible knowledge will come from lots of labor. Getting busy in the Word. A dream cometh through the multitude of business. You have to put some work into things. Ecclesiastes 5.4 When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. So if you run your big mouth and make a vow to God, you need to go ahead and go through with it. For example, today, if you say you're going to read the Bible through, just go ahead and do it. Verse 5 Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. You'd be better off not to say anything about it than to say it and not do it. Verse 6, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error, 
Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? When you say something, there is always someone hearing it. This could be referring to the angel of the Lord, where he said, Neither say thou before the angel. Let it remind you that everything you say is being heard by somebody. Obviously, God hears it, but he isn't the only one. The more you speak, the more chance you're going to have of God being angry at thy voice. So 1 Peter 4.11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If you're going to say something, let it be biblical. When you become a Christian, you most likely cleaned up your mouth. Now is your heart cleaned up. Your talk and your sleep can reveal the heart. Someone asked, can my dreams be a sin? In a sense, I think they can be because many times dirty dreams are because of dirty things you're doing during the day. And dirty talk in your sleep could be a result of what you're filling your heart with during the day or how you talk by yourself during the day even. In Matthew 12, 36, it says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Look at Ecclesiastes 5.8. It says, If thou seest the oppression of the poor, and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Evil men at night will lay down in their beds and think about what evil things they're going to do. In Micah 2, 1, it says, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. And what does he, uh, Solomon say here? If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. You know, this. we knew this was going to happen. Evil things that, you know, are just really coming to pass with people in leadership and when you see men in authority oppressing the poor and you see violent perverting of judgment remember God is higher than the highest and he's going to take care of it you know we movies there's been movies made about it there's been preaching about it numerous videos about it and now we're seeing it right before our face so, and there's really no need to marvel at it we knew it was coming I guess a lot of people just didn't think that it was actually going to happen deep down. But Psalm 92, 8 says, But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. He is higher than the highest. Ecclesiastes 5, 9, Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. The king himself has to eat the same stuff that you eat. And he may have servants that get it for him, but he's still eating the same food that his servants was eating. Ecclesiastes 5.10, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with it increase. This is also vanity. And Psalm 27.20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. A person who loves silver or money or is never going to be satisfied with it. Do you know why you aren't satisfied with your wife? It's because you're too busy looking at everybody else's wife. You can't be satisfied with anything because the more you get, the more you want. I think that's one of the reasons why you have such crazy dreams. You're busy dreaming about what you wish you had in the daytime. And that is with anything, not just your wife, but your house and your car. Back when I was a kid, I would have dreams about a certain toy or game I wanted, and then I would dream about it, and when I woke up, I would be so disappointed that I didn't get to keep the toy or basketball goal or game, whatever it was that I had in my dream. The eyes of man are never satisfied. Even as a kid, you dream about toys that aren't yours. Ecclesiastes 5.11, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? The more you get established in life, the more kids you'll end up having, and then they'll, they'll have kids. You may be a lot 
You may have a lot more when you're a grandparent. Your goods may increase. You may have more than you, you do as a newlywed, but when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. Now, my grandmother-in-law gives all her grandkids $150 for Christmas. They may have saved a lot of money over the years, but when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. About every other year, she gets another grandkid. So the more that they get, the more people that's needing stuff. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? What good is any of your material stuff other than the ability to look at it with your eyes? It's really no better than the dream. In the dream, you can just look at it. If you have a car that you get, I mean, a new car, I mean, you get, you already got a car that gets you back and forth to work. Is there really need a need to get a nicer, newer car? It would just be better to look at. All it'll be is just better to behold with your eyes. It could tear up just like the old one. My newer car tears up more than my old car. Ecclesiastes 5.12 says the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. For me personally, the harder I work, the less I dream. I have a really physically draining job, so when I get home and put my head down on a pillow at night, I'm completely knocked out, and that is if I eat little or much. If I get home and eat two huge plates for dinner, I'm about to pass out. And before I eat dinner, I'm about to pass out. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. If you're having trouble sleeping, then you're not doing much working. And there's a difference between mental, mentally working and physically working. If you want to go to sleep, I'm going to tell you how you can go to sleep. Find a job where you work really hard physically and this will put you to sleep but solomon also says the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep since a rich man is literally living his dream he can't even go to sleep at night his worries about losing his his, his money he worries about losing the spotlight he worries about social media saying something about him he's having to check his twitter he's worried about how he's going to make more money even though he already has enough to retire. The abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. It won't allow him to sleep. Ecclesiastes 5.13, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun. Namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. The riches end up hurting the owner. So many people think if I had this or if I had that or if I had this amount of money then I would make it and I would be happy. But there is a common saying that says, more money, more problems. That's very biblical. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, But they that will be rich fall into, into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Ecclesiastes 5, 14, But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. When you come out of the womb... You didn't have anything in your hand. And you're going to leave this world and you can't take anything with you in those hands. It's just like the dream. Remember? You see, you got all the toys and the cars in the dream. And you hold on to it in the dream and then you wake up and it's not there. That's how it's going to be. When you die, you can't take nothing with you. When you wake up in eternity, that stuff you were holding on to, it's not going to be there in your hand. Ecclesiastes 5.15, As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. Job 1.21 says, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All that stuff you labored for, it cannot be taken with you. But if you labor for the Lord, it's not in vain. Ecclesiastes 5.16 And this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. 
And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? It says, in all the points as he came, so shall he go. You ever think about how when you were born you needed constant assistance? And then when you get old and ready to die, you need constant assistance? Uh, you get bald like you were as a baby? You might end up wearing diapers like you did as a baby? You need a nurse? Whereas when you were a baby, you needed a mother. The first time you took your first breath when you were born. When you were born, you took your first breath and you opened your eyes for the first time. And then when you die, you'll breathe one last breath and close your eyes for the last time. Verse 17, All his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. Sometimes in these restaurants, it seems like you're eating in darkness. They don't want they don't want you to see all the stuff in the food, so they keep the lights down low, and you can't see if there's a hair in there or anything. It's so dark. But the rich man eateth in darkness many times. The average rich man, anyways, drinking off the table of devils. He has sorrow and wrath with his sickness because money can't buy his way out of that most times. Verse 18, Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he hath taken under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. If you can go to work and provide for your family, enjoy your work and your family, then this is a great gift and this is your portion. What you have is your portion and you shouldn't covet someone else's portion. Just be happy with yours. You may have a small house, one car, one kid, and the neighbor next to you has a big house, three cars, three kids. Don't be mad at God for your portion. And don't covet your neighbor's portion. Hebrews 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Ecclesiastes 5, 19 and 20. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor, labor, this is the gift of God. For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. You not only got salvation, but if you have all the things I just mentioned, you are a wealthy person. If you can eat and drink, and have a place to lay your head, then you are a very wealthy person. And if, you, if you're if you saved with all this stuff, then, then you're rich because you've got eternal life settled and you've got this physical life figured out. So you're very blessed if you have these things. There's no need to complain. There's no need to covet everybody else's things. There's no need to daydream and... Uh, all day long to where it causes you to have dreams about things that you want, things that aren't yours. What you have is the gift of God. And we need to be more thankful and not covet the things of everyone else. But this has been Ecclesiastes chapter 5.